All right. Uh, hello, class. <clears throat> Hope you're doing well. Um, today is the day before the AP exam, so uh, if you're taking the exam, I hope you're studying hard, getting some, getting some last minute studying in. Um, so a little bit of news. Hey, Sebastian. Um, tomorrow and Friday we won't have class because um, we'll just take a break. You guys are going to take the AP exam. We'll just take a couple days off. We'll come back. Monday and learn some astrophysics. Um, hello, Elena. Hello, Ainsley. Hello, Izzy. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for joining. Um, <clears throat> and then ooh, someone says they're finally here. Oh, Katie. Wow. You've joined us. Thank you. Um, so let's see, what else? Uh, some other news, it's, it's uh, Bugger's birthday today. He turns ele uh, turned 11 today. And uh, Hazel's a rescue dog, but so we don't know when, when her birthday is, but I celebrate it on the same day. So Hazel's probably 13, 14, who knows how old Hazel is. Hey, Will. Um, hey, Alex. So, and then, uh, let's see, I'm continuing to forge my knife. Um, so I showed it yesterday. Here's where I'm at today. Uh, so this was a railroad spike. And yeah, so it's very, it's very stabby right now. I kind of have a drop tip on it. So I think it looks pretty good, but it's way too thick. It's probably about twice as thick, I would say, as a as a uh, knife should be or maybe maybe yeah so i gotta thin it out um all right so co we're gonna do a couple of things today uh we're gonna go over another free response and then i'm just gonna do a quick just really lightning fast review of all the topics and um uh, and I'll give you some suggested things to, to review. Um, hey, Brenna, immediately following this, I'll be on Discord. So if you have any questions at all, <clears throat> um, please hop on the Discord. Um, another thing on the Discord is the College Board has been doing reviews on all, on all the AP topics. And there's something like 30 review videos for AP Physics 1. So there's, um, and I have a link to that in the announcements section of the Discord. So if you're looking for, um, if you need to cram, then that would be the place to go. All right, so let's get started. Um, once again, I'll be skipping uh, any question that involves circuits or waves because that is not going to be covered on this AP Physics 1 exam. Um, all right, so question one, it says, a toy consists of two identical solid spheres connected by a string with negligible mass. The toy is thrown at an angle above the horizontal such that the, the string remains taut and both spheres are revolving counterclockwise in a vertical plane around the center of the spring, of the string. So um, I'm thinking right now, this is a lot like the hammer toss experiment. Um, this toy is basically a hammer. Uh, sketch graphs of the horizontal and vertical components of the center of the string as a function of time. Um, all right. Uh, so the horizontal velocity 
we look at the horizontal velocity, well, gravity doesn't pull horizontally, and so um, the horizontal velocity is going to be constant because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, okay? Um, however, it, for the vertical component, um, we have, oops, it's supposed to be a straight line. Um, so the slope of the vertical component is going to be negative 10 meters per second squared. So it's going to slope down because gravity changes the vertical component of the velocity. Now, uh, one little subtlety, you get most of the points for drawing anything that looks similar to this, but, um, it says, notice how it says, from the instant the spheres are released until the system returns to its initial height. So what that means is that delta y equals zero. So the area under the curve of our y velocity graph has to be zero. Okay, so notice how there's, you know, this triangle here. It's a positive triangle, and then there's uh, this triangle here, which is a negative triangle, and then those two areas cancel each other out. Um, and the figure above shows the toy at the instant the center of the string uh, releases, reaches the top of its trajectory. This is a side view. The sphere on the left is higher than the sphere on the right. On the dot below, which represents the left sphere only, draw and label the forces exerted on the sphere at this instant. Represent each force by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. The dashed line is drawn at the same angle as the string. Okay, so we got gravity. Gravity points straight down. And then we've got tension from the rope connecting the two. So, um, we're going to have something like this. Okay. And you would want to label those, and this would be parallel to the string. Okay? So you'd label those as tension and weight force. Um, on the dot below, which represents the whole toy, draw and label the forces acting on the system at this instant. Um, so uh, the tension we can see the tension is an internal force between the strings because um, the, the uh, right sphere has a tension that is going this way, and then the left sphere has a tension going this way. And according to Newton's third law, uh, those are should be equal and opposite. I haven't drawn them as equal and opposite, but um, okay. So what happens is, is if you look at the system as a whole, the two tensions are included, they're internal forces, and any internal forces cancel each other out. So the only force that's left over is gravity, okay? Um, however, I'm going to draw the gravitational force as roughly twice as long because the whole system has two spheres, so there's twice the mass. Um, when the toy was released, the center of the string was moving with an initial speed of 15 meters per second at, an, at a 60 degree angle above the horizontal. Calculate the speed of the center of the string at the instant shown above when the center of the string reaches the top of its trajectory. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is a projectile motion problem. And um, so this is actually, it looks more complicated than it is, okay? We have two equations of projectile motion. We have the delta x equation, which says delta x equals vx naught times time. Vx naught times time. And then we have the delta y equation, which says that 
delta y equals v y naught times time minus one half g t squared. Okay. Um, now, when at the highest point, the y velocity is equal to zero. Okay. Um, it's a loud motorcycle. Um, the y velocity is equal to zero at the highest point. If the y velocity was not equal to zero, it wouldn't be the highest point, right? So that means the speed is equal to the x velocity. Okay? If you have no velocity vertically, if you had a vertical and a horizontal velocity, the speed would be determined by the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, but since you have no y velocity, it's just the Pythagorean theorem is trivial. It's just the x. Okay? Um, because there is no horizontal acceleration, vx final equals vx initial. Okay? vx final equals vx initial. Um, now, if we think about here's the initial velocity vector, we want the horizontal component of the velocity. That would be this leg of the triangle. Um, vx initial is going to be, so that's the adjacent leg of the triangle, so that'll be. 15 cosine of 60. Cosine of 60 is 1 half, so this would just equal 7.5 meters per second. That's the answer. Okay? All right, number two. A heavy lab cart moves with kinetic energy K initial on a track and collides with a lighter lab cart that is initially... Um, at rest. Uh, so I'm thinking momentum because it's two things colliding. The cards bounce off each other, but the collision is not perfectly elastic. So remember, perfectly elastic means that none of the kinetic energy becomes heat. Okay. Um, inelastic is when they collide and stick together. Um, so this is somewhere in between. So they don't stick together, but um, some of the kinetic energy was converted into heat. So there's some kinetic energy lost. A student wonders if the fraction of the kinetic energy lost from the two cart system during the collision depends on the speed of the first cart before the collision and plans to perform an experiment. Um, the student hypothesizes that a greater fraction of kinetic energy is lost from the system during the collision when the speed of the first cart is greater. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Briefly state one reason the hypothesis um, might be correct. Um, I would say, so here, here's what I would say, something along the lines of um, higher speed of the first cart means the force of impact will be greater, okay? Um, when the two cars hit each other, there's going to be a greater force between them. And one of the places that um, energy goes when you have an inelastic collision is it goes into, energy goes into deforming the objects that hit each other. Okay, so maybe some of that kinetic energy goes into creating a dent 
okay? Um, so if we want to have a big dent that took some of that energy, we need a large force of impact. Um, this large force of impact will um, cause large deformations in the colliding objects, which takes up the kinetic energy. Okay? I would say something to that effect. Um, B says design an experimental procedure that could be used to test the student's hypothesis. Assume equipment usually found in a school physics laboratory is available. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, if we want to see, if, if we think about what we want to design an experiment for this, um, what we want to do is, uh, so we need to know the initial velocity of cart one. We need to know the final velocity of cart one. And we need to know the final velocity of cart two. Okay? And so I'm going to measure all three of those things with, um, with uh, video analysis. Okay. Um, don't say video physics. If you design an experiment and you need to measure a velocity, don't just say video physics. Say motion tracking um, software or something like that. Maybe I should say motion tracking software. The thing is, video physics is a product. Okay. Um, it's not. So you don't, you can't guarantee that the person who grades your exam knows what video physics is. So it's better to say a more general term, okay? Um, so video analysis. And so the, the procedure would be to, you know, essentially do the collision. record all velocities, repeat for a different speed. Um, so you just keep doing that. Um, so my experiment is very simple. Um, I don't know, maybe you want to go into more detail and say how you're going to get different velocities, but I would just assume, you know, you just push the cart with different speeds. Um, describe how the experimental data could be analyzed to um, confirm or disconfirm. I don't think I've ever heard the word disconfirm before. The hypothesis that a greater fraction of the kinetic energy is lost. Um, when the first speed of the cart, speed of the first cart is greater. So, um, oh, Layla says motion sensor. That's a great, yeah, say motion, motion detector. That's another great way to uh, measure velocities. Very good. Um, okay, so uh, basically what, what you would do is you would want to take, um, you would want to take, so you have the initial velocity of cart one, and you have the final velocity of cart one, and you have the final velocity of cart two. Okay? Oh, you know, one thing I, I forgot to say, because I kind of assumed that they were just a given, is uh, you would also want to record the masses of each cart. Okay? So the initial kinetic energy is going to be one half m1 v initial 1 squared, okay? 
So you use this measured quantity and you process the data to get that. Okay? Then the final kinetic energy is one half m1 v final of the first one plus one half m2 uh, v final for the second one squared. Okay? So you're, you're using your measured quantities to calculate the initial and final kinetic energies. Um, and then what I would do is I would graph um, final kinetic energy versus initial kinetic energy. Okay? Now, um, the slope of this... So let's suppose that the data looks like a line. Okay? Then that, if the data looks perfectly like a line, then that means that k final is equal to a constant times k initial. So that would mean that the fraction of kinetic energy lost is constant. Okay? Right? It says k final over k initial is equal to a constant. But if the fraction of the kinetic energy depends on speed, then we would expect that basically the constant gets smaller the larger the initial kinetic energy is. So you would see a graph that kind of starts to fall off of the line. It's curved. Okay? So um, the student's hypothesis would be correct if we see a curved line because that means that as we achieve higher speeds, more initial kinetic energy, we get less and less final kinetic energy, okay? Less and less of a fraction of the, okay? Um, D says, consider a different scenario in which the carts stick together after the collision, so that's a completely inelastic collision. The masses of the heavier and lighter cart are M1 and M2 respectively. Uh, derive an expression for the fraction of the kinetic energy lost during the collision. All right, so this um, uh, this is so this is number two, part D. And so, all right, so we're going to use two things. First thing we're going to use is conservation of momentum, which is always true during a collision. Um, P initial equals P final. So the initial momentum is um, M1 V1 initial because only one card is moving at first. The final momentum, they stick together. So it's going to be M1 plus M2 V final. Okay? So this says that the final velocity is um, uh, the final velocity is m1 over m1 plus m2 v1 initial. Okay. Um, so then we could calculate the initial kinetic energy which would be 1 half m1 v1 initial squared. The final kinetic energy is going to be 1 half times, they're stuck together, so both masses are moving, m1 plus m2 times the final velocity squared. So we have to square this nasty expression here. Um, so when I square it, I square this term, I square that term, I square that term. So I get m1 squared over m1 plus m2 squared times v1 initial squared. Okay, so we can see that uh, this cancels with one of the factors of that, and so we get one half m1 squared over m1 plus m2 v1 initial squared. All right. Um, so now the kinetic energy lost is 
is going to be uh, k final minus k initial. So I got to subtract these two expressions. Or actually, it should be k initial minus k final, right? Because k initial is going to be bigger. Um, so I have one half. And notice how the only thing that's different is the, the mass term. So I'm just going to subtract the mass terms. So I have m1 minus m1 squared over m1 plus m2. All that times v1 initial squared. Um, then I want to divide that by k initial. k initial is this expression right here. So I have 1 half m1 v1 initial squared. So I can see the 1 halves cancel out. The v1 initials cancel out. And we get um, 1 minus m1 over m1 plus m2. So that's the expression. Um, so that's a little tricky. I would imagine that that part of the question is worth a number of points. And um, uh, so, you know, just by applying the principles of physics, you know, applying conservation of momentum, using the formula for kinetic energy, you're going to be able to um, get most of the points, if, even if the algebra gets a little bit um, too intense for you. All right, moving on to number three. Number three is about waves, so I'm going to skip number three because waves are not on this AP exam. Um, number four looks like it's about an inclined plane, so that one's uh, one that we're going to look at. Um, a student strikes a block at the bottom of the ramp, giving it an initial speed v naught up the ramp. There is friction between the ramp and the block as it slides a distance x up the ramp and slides back down. Um, on the dots below, which represent the block as it is sliding up the ramp and down the ramp, draw and label the forces, not components, exerted on the block. Okay, so no matter which way the, the block is going, we're going to have gravity, okay, and we're going to have normal force, okay. So both of these are going to be uh, present no matter what, okay. So and and they'll have the same. Um, they'll have the same size, whether the thing is going up or down, okay? So those are both gonna be present. You would wanna label those. Um, however, if you're going up the ramp, then friction, whoa. Um, if you're going up the ramp, how can I draw a straight arrow? draw a straight arrow. There we go. If you're going up the ramp, then friction points uh, down. If you're going down the ramp, because friction is an oppositional force, friction is going to point up. So it'll be, it'll be something like this. Okay? So it'll have the same size because you know, it'll have the same size, but, um, all right. Uh, the block takes a time t up to slide up the ramp a distance x. The block ta then takes a time uh, t down to slide back down to the bottom of the ramp, where it has speed v final. Uh, is t down greater than, equal to, or less than, 
uh, tee up. Okay. So uh, the correct answer is going to be that uh, tee down is greater than tee up. Okay. Uh, so why is that? Well, uh, what we can see here, while this is going up the ramp, see, notice how gravity and so these two forces, uh, friction and gravity, are both pointing down the incline. Okay, so when you're going up the ramp, you have two forces combined that are uh, slowing you to a stop, okay? Friction and gravity. However, when you're going down the ramp, friction points up the ramp and gravity points down the ramp, okay? So you have, um, you still have two forces, but they're competing with each other, okay? So what that means is that, um, so basically, according to what I just said, uh, the net force when you're going up is greater than the net force when you're going down, okay? Because when you're going up, the... Um, the two forces are in the same direction, so they don't cancel each other out. When you're going down, the two forces are in opposite directions, and so they partially cancel out. Um, so what does that mean? It means that the acceleration when you're going up, I should say the, the absolute value of the acceleration that's supposed to be brackets for absolute value, is greater than the acceleration when you're going down. Okay? Um, that's try to make this more readable. Okay? Um, so what that means is that um, this means that the block is brought to a stop faster, more quickly, than it is sped up down the ramp. Okay, so it's going to be stopped pretty much immediately on the way up. So it's going to, it's going to, the time it spends going up is going to be very small. Um, all right. Uh, all right, that was it for that question. So uh, question five is about circuits. So I would obviously, uh, I'm going to skip that and you should skip any any topic that is uh, circuit related, electric, electric force related, or wave related. Okay, so um, uh, at the request of uh, Liz, uh, I'm just going to do a lightning review of um, all the different topics that are on the exam, so this, this lesson is going to be a little bit longer. Um, I want to remind you that College Board has created review videos that will go into much more depth on all these topics. So, um, you know, please, if, if what I'm teaching you isn't enough, um, you know, then head on over to the College Board YouTube page, and they have lots of uh, videos for you. Um, oh, by the way, on my run today, I fell. I tripped. It happens to me like once per year where I'm running and I'm not paying attention and I fall over. Um, so today was that day. But luckily I wasn't running very fast, so I, I didn't hit the ground very hard, but I, 
I, and I was carrying a water bottle. And so, you know, your instinct when you're falling is to put your hands out. And I was putting my hands out, but I was holding the, the water bottle. And so the water bottle was like a cushion and then just my elbow down. So I kind of lucked out. Okay. So this is going to be a lightning review. Okay. Um, so uh, the the first subject that we covered in class was kinematics. Okay. Um, so uh, kinematics had to do with the idea of uh, displacement velocity, acceleration. So you're not, you're not saying what is causing the acceleration. You're just saying there is an acceleration. Okay. Once we get to forces, then we start to um, talk about what causes the acceleration. Um, remember, with velocity, you can have an average velocity or you can have an instantaneous velocity. Okay? Average or instantaneous. Oh, you know what else happened? Um, I'll say this for, for Katie, uh, if she's still watching. I saw Mr. G when I was uh, running yesterday. And he was running. So he was running along uh, Benita at like the Mount San Antonio Gardens, that senior home. That's where I saw him. So I don't know where he lives, but um, I saw him. Oh, maybe I can get rid of, I'll hide this one and make this larger. How about that? Ooh, that's nice. Okay. Um, all right, so we could make a number of graphs. Uh, one of the graphs we could make is a position time graph. And for a position time graph, the, uh, the bendiness of the graph is acceleration, and the slope is velocity. All right? Um, if you have a velocity time graph, uh, and it looks like this, for example, the slope is acceleration, and the area under the curve is the displacement. Okay. Now, remember, area under the curve can be negative, so that would represent a negative displacement. Um, we learned the kinematics equations. Delta x equals vx initial time, or v initial times time plus one half at squared. Uh, v final squared equals v initial squared plus two a delta x. Um, v final equals v initial plus at. So those equations are, I would say, are likely to show up somewhere. We applied this to projectile motion. And uh, the idea with projectile motion is that you know, you're throwing something diagonally. It has some initial velocity. And you use trigonometry to get the initial y component of the velocity and the initial x component of the velocity. And then you have a delta x equation. Uh, the delta x equation is delta x equals vx initial times time. And the delta y equation is delta y equals vy initial times time minus 1 half gt squared. So you'll notice that the, um, you know, the acceleration comes from the t squared term. And only the y motion has the t squared term. That's because gravity... Um, only pulls vertically. It doesn't pull horizontally. Okay? So that's kinematics. Then we talked about forces. 
Um, uh, oh, let, let me just um, talk about just really briefly, uh, just maybe I'm only going to mention them, just some representative problems that you might want to take a look at. Um, I would say take a look in your notes to um, maybe horizontal launch off a cliff. Um, angled launch across a level surface. Uh, and then maybe stopping distance. So uh, we did a problem where there was a car headed towards grandma and you slam on the brakes and you want to know, do you stop in time to uh, save grandma or do you hit grandma? Um, so these two are involving projectile motion. This one is just straight up kinematics. Hello, time for a little anarchy. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay, so forces, uh, you should know the Newton's three laws of motion. Um, the, you know, the first one is objects in motion stay in motion. Um, the second one is net force equals ma. Um, the third one is uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The force of A on B is equal to negative the force of B on A. Um, we looked at several types of forces. There was um, a weight force, mg. There was normal force. F sub n. Um, there was tension, F sub t. Uh, oh, someone else. Akshay, hello. Um, there is the elastic force, Kx. Uh, Kx is called um, the stiffness or called the spring constant. I saw something really interesting. Um, apparently, College Board was monitoring like Google searches during the AP Physics C exam, and uh, one of the AP Physics C exam questions was about springs. And so, basically, people were Google searching all the different terms that were showing up on the AP exam. So. Um, there was a spike in searches for spring constant, which was the second question on the exam. And it was later in the exam time window. So it was, it was funny. If, if you're Googling spring constant while you're taking the physics exam, you're probably not going to do very well if you don't remember what spring constant is, also known as stiffness. Um, let's see, you know, other forces are, of course, uh, static friction, and the maximum static friction is mu sub s times normal, and then kinetic friction, which is mu sub k times normal. Um, let me give you some representative problems to, to think about. Um, I would think about the Atwood machine problem. So this is a, a quasi one-dimensional system. You have M1, M2 connected by a string. Um, quasi one-dimensional system, I think, is a, is a problem that is likely to show up. Um, incline plane is likely to show up. Uh, so remember, with an inclined plane, the normal force is mg cosine of theta. OK? Uh, why is it mg cosine theta? It's because, um, because 
the normal force cancels out the component of the weight force that is um, going into the incline, so those two have to balance each other out. This is the normal force. This is mg cosine of theta. Um, the force, the component of the weight force that actually is parallel to the incline is mg sine theta. Uh, so you may or may not have friction present. Um, so that's an important problem. Uh, I would say a third important problem for forces are uh, two-dimensional force problems where you have some kind of a, um, you know, it might be a box where it's being pulled at an angle, okay? Um, and so you'd still have normal force. Maybe this is a force of tension. Uh, you still have weight force, um, and you may or may not have friction. Um, and so when you have a two-dimensional force problem, you have the net force in the x direction equals m times the x acceleration. Um, and then the net force in the y direction is equal to m times the acceleration in the y direction. Now, in this case, probably the y acceleration is zero because the block isn't being lifted up into the air. Okay? So these are three important um, problems. Um, so that's forces. Looking at energy, uh, we started off by learning about work. Work is um, energy added to the system. And the formula for work is force times displacement times cosine of theta, where um, in general your force and your displacement are not going to be in the same direction. Um, uh, it's like when I'm, it, it's actually a lot like this problem, right? Um, this might be a person pulling on the box diagonally but the box slides horizontally, okay? Um, another example I can think of is locking Hazel, okay? Um, I pull on Hazel one way, and she goes a different way. So the for my force that I'm applying on Hazel and, my disp and Hazel's displacement are not in the same direction, okay? Because she's not very good on a leash. Um, so this is energy added to a system. This is for a constant force, okay? Um, if, the, if the force is not constant, you have this kind of a force versus position graph, and the area under the curve is the work. Okay? Um, then we talked about some different types of energy. There was... Uh, kinetic energy, there's elastic potential energy, and there's gravitational potential energy. Okay? Um, the, all right. Uh, one of the things, if, if I want to talk about the energy of the system, uh, it depends which terms you can include depends on the um, depends on the definition of the system. So if I say that the system is a mass and a spring, then I'm going to include both the mass and the spring. okay? If I say that the system is only a mass that's moving, all I include is 1 half mv squared. If I say that the system is mass and earth, then I would include one half mv squared and one and gravitational potential energy. Okay, so depending on what's, you can only have gravitational potential energy if earth is part of the system. You can only have elastic potential energy if um, the spring is part of the system. 
Uh, all right. So cons conservation of mechanical energy says that the initial mechanical energy plus the work done equals the final mechanical energy. Okay. So um, in the case... So this is work done by something external, right? Um, remember, work is energy transferred to a system. So let's suppose that the system was just a mass. Then you're going to have 1 half mv squared being your initial energy. And then there's going to be an external work done on the system due to gravity. Okay, and that results in your final energy. Um, so if the system only has the mass, then gravity is an external force doing work on the system. Um, what if I define the system to be Earth plus um, the block that's moving? In that case, the initial energy consists of... Um, kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy and then there's no external work because there's nothing no other forces acting on the system so um, the AP exam kind of it likes to define the system pay close attention to what it defines as the system um, power is the work that you do divided by the time it took um, so another equation for that is force times velocity times cosine of theta. All right. So that, that's energy. And again, I would stress, um, pay close attention to the definition of the system. Okay. Um, what are some representative problems with energy? Um, I would say anything where you're like launching something with a spring. Um, so using energy to figure out what's the launch speed. Uh, it could be um, uh, you know maybe a roller coaster problem where there's a roller coaster cart, something like that that's going down. Um, Next topic was momentum. Uh, there's something called impulse, uh, which is denoted by J. Impulse is force times time. Uh, this is for a constant force. If you have a non-constant force, the impulse is the area under a force time graph. Um, so impulse is basically energy added to a system, or, or mo excuse me, momentum added to a system. So the, the impulse due to the net force is the change in momentum of the system. Okay. Um, so of course momentum is mv, and the law of conservation of momentum says that in collisions, P initial equals P final. Okay. Um, what are the representative problems for momentum? Uh, one representative problem would be, uh, you know, the completely inelastic collision where you have m1 v1 initial equals and then they collide and stick together so the the two masses combine uh, that's a common one another common one is um, uh, elastic collisions where you have k initial equals k final but in general um, in general the final kinetic energy is not equal to the initial kinetic energy, all right? 
So the only time you would assume that this is true is if it specifically says it is an elastic collision. Otherwise, you use momentum conservation. Momentum conservation is always going to be true. This is only going to be true sometimes. So if you apply this at the wrong moment, uh, you're going to get the answer wrong. Um, one thing to remember is that external forces, so when I say an external force, I mean a force from something that is not part of the system. Okay, College Board is going to define the system. They're going to say the system is these items. Anything that's not on that list of items that is exerting a force on something that is in the system, that's an external force. And external forces can change momentum. Just like external work, external work changes energy, external forces change momentum. All right. Um, the next thing we discussed was circular motion. Um, something's moving in a circle. Its uh, velocity is tangent to the circle. The acceleration is towards the center. So is the force. You need a force to move in a circle. Uh, velocity is going to be the distance traveled, which will be the distance around the circle divided by the time it took, which we call the period. Um, the size of the acceleration is v squared over r, which could also be written as 4 pi squared r over t squared. Um, uh, what else do I want to say about that? Uh, Newton's second law applies to things moving in a circle. F, if something is moving in a circle, then you say F equals mv squared over r. Um, the force that causes something to move in a circle, that is called the centripetal force. All right. Uh, what are some representative problems that you should think about? One is a horizontal circle. Uh, a horizontal circle is a, is a circle that stays at the same elevation the entire time. Okay. Um, usually the thing, the, the force that could be playing the role of the centripetal force could be tension, for example. It could be, um, you know, friction. It could be gravity if it's something in orbit. Um, <clears throat> second now. I'll be right back in one moment. I'm going to look where the pipe is. Um, uh, and then the other thing you want to look at is a vertical circle. Um, and so a vertical circle is a little bit trickier because when you're at the top of the circular arc, um, your acceleration points downward because that's where the center of the circle is. Um, and you have weight force going down. And then you have another force, maybe. Okay. Um, when you're at the bottom of the circle, your acceleration is upward and you have weight force going down still. This force, and then you have the other force. So uh, it, it's a little bit tricky. You might want to review your notes for vertical circle. Let me see if anyone's still watching me. Ethan says College Board is Big Brother from 1984. Yes. 
Um, I love that book, 1984. I think I read it. Yeah, I read it in high school and it, it like blew my mind. Love that book. Um, let's talk a little bit about gravity. Gravity. Gravitational force, of course, is big G M1, M2 over R squared. Uh, Ethan asks, how do you think the test will deal with incorporating all seven topics? I think that it will only have a select few topics, yeah. Because it's only two questions. Um, uh, and one of the questions is going to be about designing an experiment. So for that question that is about designing an experiment, we, we did a lot of experiments in the class when we were in class. So for that one, you know, it might even be a good idea for you to, to uh, take the AP exam with your lab notebook next to you. Um, and then, this is a really good idea, Use have your lab notebook next to you and literally, if it's asking you to design an experiment on energy or momentum or something like that, flip to that page in your lab notebook and you have an experiment right there that you did. Um, so think about that, okay? I don't, I don't think there's any way that they can test all seven topics in, um, in 45 minutes. There's just, I mean, you can see I'm doing a lightning review and it's, it's taking me, you know, over an hour to do it. And I'm, I'm not even through all the topics yet. Uh, so uh, this is the gravitational force. Um, the gravitational field is denoted by little g. And it's big G times the mass of the central body divided by the distance from the central body squared. Um, the gravitational force is just the mass of the object feeling the, the gravitational field times the strength of the gravitational field. Um, uh, Layla, you may be right. I'm, I'm not sure. I've, I thought, I know AP Physics C had an experimental design question, so... Um, We learned Kepler's law, which is gmt squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed. And then um, just after the school closed, I also taught you the equation for gravitational potential energy. That is the equation you would use if it's a, a planet, something that's really far out there. Um, and that equation is uh, negative g m1 m2 over r. So there's not r squared, it's just r. Okay? Um, I would say Kepler's law is the most likely problem that you would encounter. Maybe a linearizing graph problem. Okay. Okay, Will says he read the same thing from Jacob's Physics. I hate that Jacob's guy. I don't like him. He has a punchable face. Um, he, he's, he's sort of like the, the physics teacher who has been, um, you know, he's like the shill for College Board. As, as in physics teacher form. All right. Um, so what what uh, what other topics do we have? I think we have uh, simple harmonic motion. Uh, so for simple harmonic motion, we had uh, two systems that we uh, two systems. 
So one of them is the mass spring system, and the period of the mass spring system is 2 pi square root of m over k. And then the other system we studied was the pendulum system, where the period was 2 pi square root of L over G. You want to remember um, what the period depends on. So in particular, it doesn't depend on amplitude. Um, the period of a mass spring system doesn't depend on gravity. Uh, the period of the the period of the pendulum doesn't have to do with the mass of the pendulum bob. All it has to do with is the length and gravity. Um, for the case of the um, the mass spring system, uh, we analyzed it in terms of energy. So the energy was one half m v squared plus. I'm getting a call from Claremont Unified School District. I'm going to decline it. Um, plus one half k x squared. And we learned a couple of different equations. So when something is in simple harmonic motion, it reaches its maximum speed when it goes through equilibrium. So one of the expressions for energy is 1 half m v max squared. Another one is um, 1 half k a squared, where a is the amplitude. Um, so this expression comes from evaluating the energy at the extreme point. This expression comes from evaluating the energy at the equilibrium point. Um, I should also say that a position time graph for simple harmonic motion looks like a wiggle, where this is the period, and this is the amplitude. Um, let's see. Uh, I, oh, I should also talk to you about the defining equation of simple harmonic motion. Um, the defining equation is acceleration equals minus omega squared x. And um, so anytime you can put the equation of the system into that form, uh, it's going to do simple harmonic motion. Omega is a constant that depends on the properties of the system. And omega is related to the period. It's 2 pi over period. Um, so that's more or less simple harmonic motion. Uh, let's see. Akshay asks, what do the mass, what do the mass represent in the gravity equations? Um, so, uh, this is the mass of the central body. This is the mass of the central body. Okay, um, little m is the mass of the thing feeling the gravitational field. Okay, so big M is the mass of the planet or the thing that's making the system gravitate. Okay, so I believe the last topic is uh, rotations. All right, which is probably the the trickiest topic. So I I would say. Um, oh, Izzy asks, for a system on Earth, would we use g equals 10 meters per second squared or 9.8? I don't think it makes one bit of difference. They're not going to grade you down either way. Uh, I would use 10 just because it's a nicer number uh, to deal with. All right. The important thing is that you show comprehension. Uh, as I was saying, I would recommend that you watch one of those uh, College Board videos or something for a refresher on rotations if, if you don't feel comfortable with it, okay? Because it's a, it's a pretty big topic. Um, we talked about torque, which is F perp times R, where uh, if you have some blob, and there's a force acting on the blob. 
and let's say that this is the pivot point. Um, so this is, the, here's the pivot point of the object. Here's where the force is actually applied. So the distance from the pivot to where the force is applied, that is R. And then once we've drawn this line for R, that allows us to make a force triangle with our force. Okay? And that component right there is F perp. Okay? Um, so you have to do trigonometry to get F perp. Um, Counterclockwise torques are positive. So um, this would be a positive torque because it would tend to make the blob rotate in the counterclockwise sense. Um, so we could think about torque as like a twisting force. Uh, then we learned about rotational inertia, which is sum over m r squared. So all the different masses, and r is the distance from the axis of rotation. Um, and it it's sort of like the rotational analog of mass. Okay, mass is how, how difficult it is to accelerate something. Inertia is how difficult it is to make something spin. All right. Um, and, and I should say it has nothing to do with friction. So it, it's like how difficult is it to make something spin if you had a perfectly frictionless axle. Um, Newton's second law for rotation says that the net torque equals I alpha, where alpha is angular acceleration. Um, so angular acceleration is the rate of change of angular velocity. And of course, angular velocity is the rate of change of angle. Okay, so we had uh, some equations of um, some equations for angular kinematics. So there was delta theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. There was omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus two alpha delta theta. There was omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. Okay, so these are the exact same as the equations for linear kinematics. They're just tweaked for angular. The interpretation is different. Also, your motion graphs for angular motion are um, uh, you know, all the knowledge that I just explained for uh, where is it? It's on this piece of paper. You know, if this was position versus time, uh, what if it was angle versus time? Then bendiness would represent alpha, slope would represent omega. Um, if this were angular velocity versus time, slope would represent alpha, area under the curve would represent angular displacement. Um, we talked about rotations and, and energy. Um, so there was a rotational kinetic energy, which was one half I omega squared. Um, and so your total kinetic energy was the sum of your, uh, translational and your rotational. Okay. Now, if something is rolling without slipping, then V equals omega times R, where R is the radius that it's rolling about. So this allows you to basically say omega equals V over R and plug that in right there. Um, so a good representative problem would be, you know, something rolling down a hill. Um, Remember, certain shaped objects have certain I values. So a disc, a hoop, a sphere, all have different I formulas that are obtained from this. This is the 
the fundamental basic definition of inertia, but if you use that for a specific shape, you can get a, a nice clean formula, um, which they, they would give you. You don't need to know what that formula is. Um, let's see. I think probably the last topic is uh, maybe uh, angular momentum, which is denoted by L. Um, and L is mv perp r. This is for something that's a tetherball-like object, or it is i omega. Okay. Um, so, uh, angular momentum is conserved if there is no external torque. Okay, so you have all of these different um, quantities that are conserved. You have energy. Energy is conserved if there is no external work. Momentum is conserved if there is no external force. Angular momentum is conserved if there's no external torque. So um, you should know what chain, what makes a quantity conserved in a certain situation, okay? Um, because basically it determines what equation you're going to use to solve the problem. If momentum is conserved, then you're going to use P initial equals P final. But if energy was not conserved, then you wouldn't use E initial equals E final. Okay, so it tells you what you what you can and can't use in terms of equations. Um, I'm sort of a representative problem for um, uh, for angular momentum might be a, a stick that has inertia I. Okay, and maybe it's not spinning. So th this is a top view of the stick. Um, and something comes in, like a ball, with velocity v, and it comes in and it hits the stick. Okay, and it, um, uh, once it hits the stick, it sticks. So then what you have is you have this system is spinning okay here's the ball that hit it and then after it hits it starts spinning okay um, that's a pretty common problem so uh, this is a problem where where uh, energy mechanical energy is not conserved okay because it's it's basically an inelastic collision. The two things are hitting each other, and we know that when two things collide and stick, uh, some of the kinetic energy is converted to heat. So we can't use energy conservation. Similarly, we can't use momentum conservation. Why is that? Because um, the pivot, okay, uh, is going to exert a force on this rod when, when there's a collision, okay? It's kind of like if you if you caught a ball that was moving really fast, um, when you catch the ball, right, there's a force from your shoulder on your arm, right? Your shoulder absorbs the blow. So uh, there's going to be an external force from the pivot because the pivot is not part of the system. It's an external force. Um, so basically, in this situation, your only conservation law is angular momentum. Now, the initial angular momentum is the momentum of this blob thingy. So it's going to be mvl. Let's say that l is the length of the, um, okay, is the length of the, the rod here. And then the final angular momentum is, again, the angular momentum of, uh, see, notice how 
before the thing that was carrying the angular momentum was this tetherball-like object, so I used MVR. But now once it's an extended object that's rotating, I'm going to use the I omega. Okay? I have to be careful though because the inertia isn't just I. It's also the inertia be because it's not just the rod anymore. It's the rod and the thing that's stuck to the end. Um, so there's we also have to include the inertia of uh, the blob that's stuck to the end of the rod, which would be ml squared times omega final. So we could take this equation, we could solve for omega final. Okay. Um, so those are, I think I got all the topics. Um, I'm thinking, uh, one thing I forgot to mention was the uh, sneaky form of Newton's second law. So I'll just write that right here. Net force is rate of change of momentum. Uh, so, um, anyways, that's my review. Um, I'm going to hop on the Discord uh, immediately. So, if you have any questions at all about um, about physics. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I won't have I won't be able to answer your sort of like logistics questions quite as well, um, but I can direct you to the correct College Board resources. So, um, uh, so I hope to talk to some of you on Discord. And wow, fourteen of you made it through an hour and twenty minute review. Good for you guys. Um, good luck tomorrow. I'll be thinking of you. Hopefully I'll wake up on time. I might sleep while you guys are taking the exam, uh, which is what I usually want to do when you guys are testing. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, I could take a nap. It would be amazing right now. Um, all right. Have a great afternoon. I hope to talk to you on Discord. Bye now.